It's very interesting. As we talk about the evolution of payment models, organizations like the ED Benchmarking Alliance are now in a unique position because you possess data, a unique position to set the culture and the tone for the dialogue that relates to payment models because most of the evolution of payment models now, if you really peel back the onion, there's a cost component that's been slowly through multiple tendrils and multiple parallel programs been growing. And we're gonna dissect that out a little bit. If we look at the big picture, going all the way back to 1997, it was all about cost then. It was just called something else. The Balanced Budget Act in 1997 tied all required growth in Medicare spending and the Medicare budget to the growth of GDP, gross domestic product. The reason for that is Medicare Part A, the biggest component of the Medicare budget at that time, was derived almost entirely from payroll taxes that we all pay now. We all pay a flat tax. People sometimes think of, oh, FICA, that's Medicare plus Social Security. If you look deep into your paycheck, you'll see 1.45% is the Medicare flat tax that we all pay, and that's uncapped. If you make $100,000, $200,000, $300,000, if you're a 1099 employee, you pay it on both sides, so a little bit less than 3%. So the thought was, well, if the revenue to fund Medicare comes from the tax base, then we tie it to gross domestic product, and we only allow Medicare spending to increase if the tax base goes up. Well, that worked great because we were partying like it was 1999, and you can see on the left side of the slide, GDP was growing at 5 or 6% a year. Then we enter this period of time in the early 2000s where Medicare expenses started to grow even more significantly. The slope of that curve was a little bit steeper due to expensive medications and what started to happen, particularly in our EDs, an explosion of complex and at that time expensive imaging, CT, ultrasound, VQ, MRI, MRA. And now we start to have a gap between the growth in the Medicare budget and the growth in the tax base. And all of a sudden the bottom falls out, 2007, 2008, gross domestic product printed for the first time in 50, a negative number. Look at that, negative 0.5%. So we went from a high in 1999 of a little over 6%, gross domestic, our economy actually contracted during the Great Recession. That set in place a spiral of processes where ultimately we peaked where Medicare spending had increased dramatically, the tax base had decreased dramatically, and in 2012 we had a 27% decrease on the books for the Medicare conversion factor. That's what each of us are paid per RVU by Medicare. Right now it's about 36 bucks, and it would have been $28.17 had that passed. Incredible process. So th those of us who were involved in advocacy, we were left going along with ASEP members, uh, EDPMA members, ED Directors Academy members, and the House of Medicine and the AMA up to Capitol Hill every year pleading to not have this 20, 25% cut. We had 17 pleadings that took place. And lo and behold, in 2015, MACRA, the Medicare Access and Chip Reauthorization Act was passed and did away with that tie between the tax base and GDP and overall Medicare spending, the sustainable growth rate formula that was mandating that 20, 21% cut to the conversion factor, what Medicare pays us per RVU, gone. In its place though, we had to accept a very complicated quality program that a lot of folks in this room are involved with, the merit-based incentive payment system. And it's turned out to be a little bit more complex than the government thought. And it's not by accident that it looks like we're shaking hands with the devil. I'm glad that was humorous for some folks. So at the top of this slide, we've got the Medicare payment per RVU, 35.9996, just about $36. And under MACRA, the MIPS program allows for an increase in the Medicare conversion factor, what Medicare pays us per RVU, of half percent every year. So as opposed to, oh, we're gonna be down 20%, we've gotta beg Congress, we're gonna be down 27%, I now know the conversion factor within half a percent out the next 10 years. So terrific from a budgetary perspective. And it's probably not going to go down. It's probably going to 
be stable or up a little bit. But in its place, we took a bunch of disparate quality programs, again, that a lot of folks in this room are involved with, and combined them. We took the PQRS program, the quality reporting program that folks were familiar with, something called the value modifier that was working in the background and meaningful use, put them all together into the merit-based incentive payment system, which is a very, very complicated process so we could have a whole separate afternoon talking about. We're just sort of paying homage to it as far as the influence on payment models. And if you look in the middle of the slide, you can see those purple arrows. In 2018, we have plus or minus 5% of our money based on our merit-based incentive payment system score. So no more big swings to the Medicare conversion factor, the SGR formula all gone, but we have this new complex quality program and there's a, an overt cost component. And we'll look at some of that detail. Here are the MIPS performance category weights and everybody in this room, their groups are subject to it. If you have a very, very low threshold of Medicare, patients, you see less than 200 Medicare patients over an entire year, you might not be subject to it. But since most ED groups come up with a sort of a solution that works for everybody in the group, whether it's a part-timer, a moonlighter, full-time, director, assistant director, this program applies from a leadership perspective to everybody in the room. And we've got a couple of categories here. We've got quality, started at 60% the first year in the program, then down to 50, then down to 30. And there are some little adjustments if you're what's called a hospital-based physician, which is what we are, because we are generally exempt from that middle category, advancing care information, which is the old meaningful use process. So in 2020 and 2020 payments are based on 2018 actions. So what we do right now today and report to the federal government or they derive independently from our claims, which is the way the cost component is scored impacts the way we'll be paid in 2020. And if you look at what's called an explanation of benefits right now in 2018, your group has its own little conversion factor, which was adjusted up or down a hair, one or 2%, based on how you did in 2016. So real dollars at play. Then we got improvement activities and right out there, cost. And that's the theme, and that's where it relates to benchmarking and utilization processes. The cost component, the first year of the program was at zero. Now it's at 10%. And by statute, it is required ultimately to go to 30%. And that's proved challenging for CMS. They have two really junky measures for emergency medicine. Total per capita cost. So what's, what's my average cost to take care of a Medicare beneficiary? And it doesn't really relate to all my ED stuff. It relates to all of that patient's Medicare expenses and Part B allowables. So a little disconnect for emergency medicine. And then Medicare spending per beneficiary during a particular episode of care. And there's a complex flawed formula by which we are often assigned Medicare patients based on what's called the plurality of care. We delivered a little bit more primary care services through our E&M codes, so those 99281 through 99285, than anybody else. I've seen the psychiatric patients, they never see a doctor, they come to the ED a hundred times, and then ultimately they are admitted for other medical reasons, often attributed to emergency providers. So there's some major flaws, and there's been a lot of advocacy work, but I think the take home is the cost component, it's right out there. 10% of that MIP score is based on cost, and they call it cost, and it's going up to 30%. Now let's sort of pivot a little bit to the private payers. For those who are looking on the screen, I think this is kind of small. If you're reading on an iPad, then thank you, and you can probably read it. Deciding where to get care. This is Anthem in the Mid-Atlantic. The emergency department is not always the correct place to obtain care. And what's right below that on the Anthem website, Anthem Acute Care Solutions. This is a very sophisticated, very user-friendly tool. It lays out the spectrum of cost, convenience, and severity of illness, looking at live health online. So, hey, I have a small problem. They list them, flu, allergies, fever, sinus infection, diarrhea, pink eye, and other eye infection, skin infection, or rash. I have a minor medical complaint, not a traumatic injury. Live health online, click, talk to a doctor now. 
So I had a friend who had this exact product. He had a rash on his face, a vesicular rash. His daughter's wedding was in a week. Click, Live Health Online talks to a doctor. It was a doctor. There was no video component, so just talks. Describes the rash as this sort of blistery rash. Well, in my differential, I've got poison ivy. I've got zoster, a couple of bad things. The doc determines it's poison ivy and prescribes prednisone over the phone, which, and it was poison ivy. He actually showed it to me. He FaceTimed me. I got to see it, actually. No copay for this service. This is a free service, and it says, talk to a doctor right now, see a doctor or therapist without leaving your home. So no copay for that. Now we're going to move up in the spectrum, retail health clinic, tiny copay, five bucks, doctor's office, $10 copay. Now we're maybe investing a little bit more time, maybe you have a slightly more severe illness, urgent care, and all the way on the right side of the slide in red, the emergency department, the highest severity, most time invested, highest cost, the average copay under these products between $250 and $400 to go to the emergency department. So it's free to get your prednisone without even seeing a doctor, but from the convenience of your home, so you know you should feel good about that, or retail health clinic and anything possible in the hands of the patient. And why is that? It's to decrease cost, decrease cost. Now we've got the consumer's perspective. This is a very, very hot issue in the billing company world. Who is quickly becoming the major payer of bills? It's us in the room, right? Has anybody had health care? It's the beginning of the year right now. Anybody in this room have a deductible less than $500? Less than 500 bucks? Yeah. Anybody have like a four or $5,000 deductible? Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of hands go up. So on the left side of the slide, we're showing the growth in high deductible health plans among employers. Going back 10 years, we're at two or 3%. We're now at 35 to 38% of employers where the dominant product that's being offered is a high deductible health plan. Interestingly, we correlate that with the graph on the right side, and we can see patients funding and employers contributing often to health savings accounts. And we've got a huge increase from essentially zero dollars 10, 10 years ago to almost $100 billion now in HSA accounts. So who bears the cost for not just the copay, but the actual bill? Well, if your deductible is $2,000, $4,000, the billing agent needs to get into that HSA account by sending the patient a statement in order for you to be paid, as opposed to electronically sliding a clean claim out to Blue Cross, you're contracted, state law mandates a 21, 28 day turnaround, money comes back automatically. The data is now starting to show that the success rate of getting that, it's the same visit, the same cost, but getting that money from the patient is 20% less effective, 20%, and I'm starting to hear even bigger numbers from certain groups, 20% less effective than getting it from the insurance company. Cost matters. Pointing patients away from high cost hospitals. This is in New England. So we moved from mid-Atlantic to New England. The Anthem product was on the West Coast. Members face extra charges if they go to one of 15 higher cost hospitals. And then this was really terrible. Consider switching your doctor if his or her affiliation is only at one of these higher cost hospitals. This is in New England. These are some of the nation's leading preeminent teaching institutions, and they are contracted, they are contracted with Blue Cross, but Blue Cross still wants you to stay away from them. For instance, high-tech radiology. You go to a lower cost hospital, your co pays 50 bucks. You go to a higher cost hospital, your co pays 500 bucks. Why is that? You get your CAT scan done at XYZ Fantastic Hospital, that's where the radiologist is, then you're sent to the emergency department when it shows a problem, then the surgical consultation takes place, and then all of a sudden you've had your surgery and you are in network and getting all of your care through that very expensive hospital. 
All of our providers and hospitals are rigorously credentialed. Members can feel good about switching to a lower cost share facility or provider. I mean, really aggressive tactics. And then who supplies most of the insurance in the New England area? It's really mostly employers, right? So in the, in the Mid-Atlantic area where the federal government is located, the federal government is a very, very large provider of insurance. In New England, it's mostly employers. Companies that sign up for the plan receive a 6% premium discount. So I've got 800 employees. I'm gonna go ahead and shop for health insurance. Oh, if I pick this plan, the, the premiums are 6% less. Terrific. Cost, cost, cost is the theme. The ED Benchmarking Alliance really through gathering utilization and benchmarking data, you know what we're tracking? We're really tracking cost. And that's where I think some of this will come into play. If we look at the hospital payments, this is 2017 compared to 2018, hospital payments, level one, two, three, four, five, critical care, they're paid using the same codes, they're paid much more than we are. Level five in 2018, $520.81. Those payments for each ED facility level are going up a little bit each year. Why is that? The most brutal tool that the federal government has to control cost is to say, we give you a single payment for everything that takes place. We can't figure out all the different apples and oranges and CAT scans and labs and x-rays and ultrasounds. You figure it out. Here's your lump sum payment and it's going to be a little bit less than the sum of the parts. Now you, the hospital, figure out how to be a little bit more parsimonious internally with your care and resources. What does that sound like? Oh, let's measure our CAT scans, our ultrasounds, our admission rate, our placement and observation. This is right out of what's called the outpatient final rule, the OPPS, outpatient prospective payment system final rule. OPPS rule gives hospitals a stake in managing their resources to generate better coordinated and ultimately more affordable outpatient care. Federal government, I don't know, it's really complicated, you hospital, we're gonna take all of the costs, we're gonna subtract seven or 8% and give you a lump sum payment at the, what's called the geometric mean cost, and you figure it out, just do a better job. Observation, even more so. Everything, when we place a patient in observation, Everything is bundled. The hospital for Medicare gets a single payment now. And look at the increases in the payment. So we're moving along 2010, 700 bucks, and then all of a sudden we've got a big jump in 2014. We're up to $1,200. What happened? The packaging process started to be applied, moved from the ED visits up the chain to the more expensive observation visits. 2016, we had a huge change. I won't get into all the technical components, but observation has been reclassified as what's called a comprehensive APC. It includes everything. CAT scan, ultrasound, IV fluids, medications, rocephin, Zithromax, surgical, everything is included in that OBS. How did they come up with the $2,200 that's paid currently? They took the sum of the costs for all the individual charges, subtracted seven, eight percent, and said, here you go, do a good job. It's the cudgel that the federal government uses to control costs. So does CT utilization matter? Well, we don't want to irradiate pediatric brains. We've heard great data surrounding that. So there's a safety component. There's a big cost component. Not a single CAT scan that we do on observation patients is paid for anymore. It's all included in that bundled payment. And what's the catch? And I just sort of lay things out here. The lab supplies, add-on codes, drugs. For those who are involved on facility side, revenue cycle, there's some additional technical detail. But that's why cost matters. The other thing is we're competing with a parallel model. So certain insurance companies have taken things even further. Here's the Kaiser Hub model. Kaiser Research, 91% of its members' ED visits could be treated in a multi-specialty hub. 50% treated discharged to home, so they never come to an emergency department. 50% kept in observation for 23 hours. Any Kaiser leaders in the room? Kaiser leaders? I think there were a couple in yesterday's component of the meeting. This is a phenomenally successful program. These patients receive tight, tight follow-up care 
They have no copay. They have no deductible. They pay their monthly premiums and they stay out of the hospital. Now, who's manning these centers? The most effective centers are manned by emergency physicians. I've got lots and lots of partners in the DC area where this model really has gotten steam that are working at Kaiser facilities now running these sort of large treatment observation areas where they treat a majority of the patients. Take a community hospital, 40,000 visits in the mid-Atlantic area. This is real data. The admission rate at that facility is 18%. The Kaiser admission rate, and I can tell you because I've worked there, the Kaiser patients are actually sicker than the average patient. It happens in this area. The Kaiser cohort is uh, a leftover, what's called group health association cohort of patients, which were old, old DC residents that were, even had to manage Medicaid patients stuffed into that cohort. They're sicker than average. As opposed to an 18% admission rate, the Kaiser admission rate is 9%. Why is that? That hospital has a protocol. When the Kaiser patient comes, they receive stabilization in the ED, and you can simply write an order for that patient to receive follow-up the next day. The unit clerk is responsible for making a call. They never have to talk to, wake up a doc, talk to an on-call person. They speak to the nurse advisor line, and you make a patient appointment for the next morning at 9, 10, 11 o'clock, and you give the patient, with their discharge instructions, the detail for that appointment. Incredibly effective. Why? Really effective way to take care of cost. So we're emergency physicians. We're not victims. We're not going to be put out of business by all this measuring. In fact, everybody here is in the room to get their arms around how to measure things and achieve great outcomes. So one of the things that's been developing are what are called advanced payment models. Many folks have probably seen this slide before, but not focused on the bottom half. So the complications of the merit-based incentive payment system can be overcome. You can be exempt from the merit-based incentive payment system if you have a large percentage of your patients that fall under an advanced payment model. There are a subset, these are called advanced alternative payment models. There are a subset of alternative payment models. And the hallmark here is the group has to take on risk. So that requires a pretty robust infrastructure within the group. Say a, a single hospital community democratic group would have, a, I think, a hard time with this. Nominal risk that you have to exceed to qualify for, for this model is 8% and 25%. One out of four of your Medicare patients need to be in the advanced alternative payment model. And what's 8% of Part B allowables? So I sort of spelled it out here. A 40,000 visit, that typical community hospital that we've been talking about, your Medicare revenue usually runs $130 to $145 a patient, so roughly $1.3 million of Medicare revenue. You apply that 8%, you need to take a little more than $100,000 of risk. If you're 80,000 visits, you're a little more than $200,000 at risk. Your 100,000 visit department, you have a little more than $3 million of Medicare revenue each year, $264,000 of risk. So how are we going to solve this puzzle? Because this is the ultimate, the ultimate cost-conscious move on the part of the government. The carrot that's being dangled is if we are able to increase the rate of discharge, to discharge, 3% more of our patients, then we will qualify for certain economic bonuses. So we're gonna take patients that previously we put in the hospital, now we're gonna figure out a way to send them home. Well, so within the organized medicine community, one of the things that we reacted to is, well, fine, that Kaiser model worked well. My admission rate at that hospital is half, and the patients are actually sicker. But look at all the stuff that they have. They get plugged back into their primary care physician with an actual appointment the next day. How can we mirror something like that? We need quality and safety infrastructure. And then we weighed in from sort of the reimbursement world that I participate in. We said, well, what are some of the things that we can do? We don't have a Kaiser infrastructure available to us. Could we be paid for the care coordination to set up a visit with the primary care physician? Assuming no primary care physician is available, which I think would often be the case, could we perform a telehealth visit into that patient's home and be paid for it? 
And could we put a power professional, for instance, a paramedic, on site to check on the patient one or two or three times? And that's part of the advanced alternative payment model process that's evolving. Let's look at some of the economic opportunities. You'd be eligible for a lump sum bonus of 5% of your Medicare allowables, so about 100,000 bucks for a 60,000 visit ED. You're exempt from MIPS, and then again, the quality and safety infrastructure is incredibly important. And hey, that is the door that is open to these different methods of interacting with the patient. And we're gonna talk about growth opportunities for emergency medicine in the next lecture, but if we start to think of ourselves as the people who take care of elderly undifferentiated abdominal pain and dizziness within the four walls, guess what? We're gonna be treating elderly abdominal pain and dizziness and nothing else. That all of those anthem processes, all that retail health online, you bet United Healthcare is going into that same business as they're buying up primary care practices that are shockingly going to be open till 9 and 10 p.m. I'll believe it when I see it, but. We need to reach backwards in the acuity spectrum and not say, oh, well, I'm in charge of the stuff in the emergency room. I'm an acute unscheduled care expert, and I'm a logistics expert. And yes, we need to measure quality and benchmark it and look at utilization and look at outcomes. Why can't I take care of that otitis media, that pharyngitis, that URI in the urgent care and own that space? I took care of them in my fast track, Oh, well, they're not in my emergency department. I guess I don't want anything to do with that patient. We need to reach backwards, and we need to reach forward and reach beyond the walls of the emergency department. Telehealth, three to four RVUs. And we've already applied for waivers, which is sort of, waiver is a sort of weird way of saying an approval. We've asked for approval from Medicare that if we adopted this alternative payment model, we want to be paid for telehealth to beam into that patient's house for quality and safety reasons in order to interact with them. I want to be paid for the extra work on the phone to arrange safe discharge for a patient that otherwise might have to come into the hospital. And I want to be able to put a power professional in that house and be paid for my oversight. It's a nice, and this is a big part of where alternative payment models are, are going right now. So this is showing it, everybody learns a little bit differently. This is showing it sort of visually. At the bottom of the slide, we're going to have our complex care coordination. We're going to get three or four RVUs for spending some time on the phone, figuring out how to send home 3% of the patients if we feel comfortable with it. We're going to use telehealth to beam into that house and get three RVUs, extending our reach beyond the emergency department and put a power professional in the house. So a couple of conclusions. Payment model evolution is coming. It's coming from the federal government in incredible fits and starts. The merit-based incentive payment system got rid of that devil, the sustainable growth rate formula, but in its place, we have this now complex quality com process where cost is a huge, huge component. The insurance carriers, absolutely. That Anthem process, that website, it's very slick. Patients will be using it. The other thing is, if we look at the success of getting money out of those health savings accounts to pay for charges, and we're, not, we're just talking about patients with high deductibles, like everybody in this room, the industry is less successful. Your hospitals are less successful. The patients really care about cost. One of the first steps is owning our utilization data and benchmarking and establishing best practices. Forward thinking groups will absolutely continue to not say, well, actually, I guess I am a guy in a box here, but I am not a guy in a box. I am not in charge of just four walls. I'm going to reach backwards and lower into the acuity spectrum, own those patients that otherwise would have been in my fast track, own some longitudinal care. Any patient that touches my emergency department, if we're both the safety net and the hub of the spokes of the delivery system, any patient that touches my emergency department, I want to be able to get them all the way to a safe endpoint. And if that involves beaming into their home, sending a power professional into their home, and developing safe and reimbursable mechanisms for it, that is part of the future of the payment models. 
I've also got in the resources here an NPI lookup tool so you can see whether you fall under some of the MIPS thresholds or advanced alternative payment model processes. And I think Sherry said I could take a few yeah. questions. Yeah, anybody have any questions? Wasn't that great? I mean, I, I always find this terribly confusing, but he made it seem pretty simple, and at least you get a broad sense of where things are going. Any questions for Michael? The yeah. question is, how does this apply to critical access hospitals, rural areas, under-resourced areas? Yeah, it's a great, that's a great issue. So in our more rural areas, the first thing is, if you have a very, very low threshold of Medicare volume, you might be exempt from MIPS. If you're not exempt from MIPS, the same processes apply. And I think that these issues are even more important in critical access hospitals. The stuff that takes care of our frequent flyers, that creates that safe environment post-discharge, it's, it's not really sexy stuff, right? It's, I'm going to put a paramedic in your house, and we're going to Make sure you filled your medications. We're going to get you driven to your follow-up appointment. It's very grassroots. So I think that change comes in healthcare sort of slowly, and we are very balkanized. You know, an urban area is different than a suburban area, different than a rural area. So I think some of this change will come more slowly to rural areas, but I think it'll probably have a higher impact in, in the rural areas where that post-discharge component is so important because once that patient leaves the ED for our rural groups, that's it. They might not have a primary care physician for 40, 50 miles or for a week or, or 10 days. So I think we have a, an opportunity to play a bigger role. Great, great question, thank you. Any other questions? And material from the first lecture is certainly free, free game. The observation is that macro and MIPS keep changing with some regularity and he's asking Michael where he thinks it's going. Great, great question. Let me just get out the crystal ball here. And just, <laughs> is there anybody from the federal government in, in the room <laughs> before I launch into a little bit of a tirade here? Uh, even the folks who work on K Street feel like Medicare has done a really terrible job communicating where the quality program, forget where it's going, where it even is, what the rules are for 2018. And as Sherry is a health policy expert and said openly, I don't know, some of this stuff gets so dizzying, it's hard even to you know, pay attention to some, sometimes. The 2018 Bipartisan Budget Act that was passed just two weeks ago did have a little bit of a telegraphing of where MACRA and MIPS are going. When we made that deal with the devil, and the AMA did, did sign off on that, and they were a big part of the sustainable growth rate going away and it being replaced by the merit-based incentive payment system, there were very grandiose visions where by 2019, we'd have 30% of our MIPS score based on cost. That in order to av avoid a MIPS penalty, you would have to be at at least the median of the performance of the whole country, meaning somehow half the people would receive a penalty. And it's proven too complex. So in 2017, they slowed the process down tremendously and if you report the tiniest bit of quality data in 2017, you avoid a penalty. If you do all of your improvement activities in 2018, you avoid a penalty. And then in the Bipartisan Budget Act, they moved all of the really hard things that by congressional statute were required by 2019 all the way out to 2022. I think the program is more or less frozen in place where it is right now for the next year or two. We've got plus or minus 5%. That's probably still going to go up to plus or minus 7%. But the little steps that we need to go through to avoid a penalty are not going to escalate the way they were required to previously. We're going to have to do quality reporting. We're going to have to do improvement activities. But we're not going to have to do them at very, very significant levels in order to avoid a penalty. They're going to make it pretty easy to avoid a penalty because the program is so complex. I see a question. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. So the issue relates to, hey, the patient responsibility under OBS, we're occasionally getting a lot of complaints, at least from the hospital. I don't know if you're getting patient complaints. It's more the hospital has voiced some concern. And you said that it's all kind of bundled. So it, it's a little complicated. There's the physician component and the hospital component. 
The physician component depends on Medicare Part B because OBS is an outpatient service like emergency department care for the physicians. So Medicare Part B is an 80-20 plan. For every $100 that Medicare allows, the patient is responsible for $20. So if you do a lot of stuff to that patient in OBS, on the physician side, those little 20% coinsurances can add up. There's a second issue that relates to OBS. And it's kind of hard to get, since the Medicare fee schedule isn't very high, it's a little bit hard for those 20% to add up to a lot. There's a second thing, which is the patient is in line of fire for what are called self-administered medications. Medications that they otherwise would, by Medicare regs, be able to take on their own. Because those aren't covered under Medicare Part B, which is what the observation care falls under. So a Zestral tablet at your institution, probably the charge is 170 bucks based on some archaic process. And the patients are in the line of fire for full charges for those self-administered medications. And then the last thing is, there's something what's called the, not the two, the three midnight rule, which is in order to have skilled nursing facility care paid for and subsidized by Medicare, you need three midnights as an inpatient. And you're an outpatient as observation, so if you had you know, a, a weak, dizzy, bad fall, coccyx fracture, and ultimately that patient needs to go to a sniff, that care wouldn't be paid for by the federal government. Uh, in follow-up question, how many, you've got a, this gentleman has a very busy, over 100,000 visit emergency department. Do you receive lots of patient complaints related to OBS, or is it more of this, hosp the hospital's concept? Yeah. So the patients are concerned. Um, some of the solutions have been, Number one, you don't have to charge the patient $171 for the self-administered medications. You can decide, you can't have different charge structures, but you can decide as a policy not to charge them. And in a straw poll through the ASAP observation section, probably about one out of three do that. You can have the patient bring medications from home and then check them in through a, a verified process into your PICSIS and then have them in, administered by the nurse. And in an ED-run observation unit, which is, Chief complaint protocol driven, how many chest pain patients end up having to go to a sniff in the end? Uh, Chris Baugh, who uh, is from the Brigham, and two years ago was the director of the ASAP observation section, he and I did a comparison of a syncope patient that was admitted to inpatient versus placed in observation. It's in ASAP now, it's in the March 2016 edition. I'm happy to you know, reproduce it if somebody wants it. And we actually found the cost might be a little bit less if the patient was in observation. If you're admitted to the hospital, you have to satisfy your Medicare Part A deductible, which is the first $1,300 of, of care. So the patients have been educated, and there are some nuances. For the typical ED-type observation patient, they're probably better off in observation than they are in inpatient status, where they have that big deductible to satisfy.